Welcome to the Investor Download, the podcast about the themes driving markets and the economy now and in the future. I'm your host, David Brett. Welcome back to the second part of our two-part series on the new space race. In the first show, we covered what's driving the new space race, who's leading it, and the pros and cons of it. In part two, we're going to be discussing the potential conflicts and how they might be resolved. That'll come later in the show. Tim Marshall, author and journalist, will again uh, be our guide to space. This isn't just a first for India, it's a first in lunar exploration. No one's successfully landed near the moon's south pole before. And it's a place of real interest for space science and also space exploration. It's one of the coldest places in the solar system where water and other important chemicals are frozen in deep, shaded craters. India's recent historic first landing at the moon's south pole has paved the way to a part of the moon which scientists believe is rich in water and helium-3. So in the first part of the show, we'll be discussing the race for commodities in space. And I begin by asking Tim just how important that commodities race in space is. It's it's um, an important part of it. Um, I mean, NASA's already giving out licenses um, um, for companies to go there and get X out of the ground as an experiment. Um, and forgive me, I haven't got the facts and figures to my hand, but they're, they're like paying some private companies. All right, we'll give you a dollar a ton. It, you know, it, it's symbolic. It's because the private companies are prepared to take that risk. Um, some Japanese companies are very good at um, developing um, potential space mining equipment who have said, yep, 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 we'll go up there, we'll spend all that money, we'll get X amount of rocks for whatever, and we'll bring them back and you'll only give us a dollar. Um, because it, it, it's worth it for NASA gets the uh, NASA pays for them to get up there and then just gives them a dollar. It's worth it to them for the expertise and it's worth it for the private companies for the expertise uh, as they then try and work on the proper economic modeling of it. So they're, they're, they're very much a part of it. I mean, everyone's heard now of SpaceX, but there are still the big companies. Boeing is still involved in, in space, Airbus, Lockheed Martin, uh, Thales, uh, Thales Alinea is a French uh, Italian um, co venture. So you know, and there's the China, well, separate obviously to the American bid for space. China's got something called One Space, a uh, big company, and Space Pioneer is another of their big companies. And they, they, they have more than 100 startup space companies, China. Some of them will be as big as SpaceX. Obviously, we don't know which ones. Um, and they are working hand in glove with, with the Chinese state as well. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier, this is the big change. This, 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 um, you know, basically the, the nation state uh, wouldn't, other than China, possibly Russia, they wouldn't do it on their own anymore. Um, they're now, they're now, it's, I don't know the exact breakdown, but it's pretty much 50-50 when it comes to Americans. On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, you're listening to the Investor Download. Okay, so if we've got companies offering their services to go up to space and go and get these raw materials, what is standing in the way or what's what will prevent what's happening here on Earth where we've got these political tensions over who owns the rights no. to what? Yeah, th those tensions are already mirrored very much uh, in space. I mean, you've got, for example, uh, I mean, it's a great example, the Ukraine war. Russia knocked out the base, some of the base stations for uh, internet in Ukraine. Musk flew in thousands of, of, of dishes and terminals uh, to connect the parts of Ukraine that had lost internet to his um, satellite constellations and got them back up and running. Russia then tried to dazzle his uh, satellite constellations. Um, and, and in veiled terms, said they were a military target. Um, so we've already seen the, uh, and so there's an American private company helping, because that's what happened, the, the Ukrainian military, of course, harnessed this internet access to target Russians. So you've got an American company, 
private enterprise helping the Ukrainian state to fight the Russians who fire uh, dazzling equipment back up at... It, it, it's, it's fascinating. There's one of the tensions. Uh, another one is the uh, inability of the great powers to come to an agreement to stop testing hitting satellites with ballistic missiles, because that has happened with their own ballistics, their own satellites to test. Russia, China, USA and India have all fired ballistic missiles at their own satellites and hit them. And they can't get an agreement to stop doing that. That's pretty negative. China and Russia have the weapons to target America's most valuable assets, our satellites. Well, the United States has put both countries on notice, announcing that attacks on satellites could provoke a military response. And then when we come to this, the, the big romantic picture of humanity venturing out into space, it, it isn't. It's the Americans and allies venturing into space. And then it's the Chinese-led alliance venturing into space. Um, worlds apart, <laughs> literally, um, and I think that's that's uh, going to be the, the template for the rest of the decade. Because, given the tensions on Earth, there's no way they're going to work, except in rare, rare examples. Uh, they're, they're not working together, uh, and of course that will increase tensions. And the Moon is a good example. The Artemis Accords, led by the states, have got this clause where you can declare a safety zone on the Moon. After all, you've spent all that money getting there and finding the right place to mine and starting to dig. And then someone rocks up next year and says, I'm going to dig there as well. Fine. But but that's not a law. That's a bunch of guys that have agreed something, but they haven't agreed it. So, yeah, you can just see these tensions being replicated. Yeah. So are these talks about the rules of law within space ongoing at the moment? Well, they are, but they're just not making any progress. I mean, we have the Outer Space Treaty in 1967, but it's 50 years out of date. There were no such things as lasers, laser weapons, and there are laser weapons now, directed energy beams, dazzling equipment, etc. So we don't have the treaties where we've agreed we will do X, but not Y, which are fit for purpose for 2023. Um, that's, a, that's a serious problem. And... Um, I mentioned the Artemis Accords and this idea of safety zones. Congress bans NASA from working with China, so there is no chance of uh, cooperation there. The Russians are hardly about to join the Artemis Accords or indeed be invited. So I would argue that we are at a standstill. Of course, everyone's aware of the new tech, aware of the problems that they're bringing, looking at ways to get solutions to this, but they're not actually going anywhere. I mean, the United Nations has a, a space office and it's, you know, its offices are chock a block full of very worthy papers uh, about how to solve all this and they're all gathering dust. So as long as we have the tensions here until they subside and we, you know, we, we reach another detente, um, I'm afraid I don't see much progress on that. I, I liken it to the Klondike gold rush. You know, nobody stopped as they were scrambling across the, the, uh, the, the, the ice with their pickaxes to say, actually, hang on, hang on a minute. Let's just uh, take this slowly. And um, how big is your pickaxe? Well, OK, I won't have a bigger one. No, no, you just get there. And I'm afraid that's what's going on now. On Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, you're listening to the Investor Download. We struggled on Earth to get along nicely and play together nicely. So, and, and that sort of comes into also, uh, it comes into play when it, we're talking about uh, all these rockets that are being built and the space stations and whatever, whatever ports are going to be placed on the moon. These are going to be kitted out by various different uh, countries. Mm. I mean, how difficult is that going to be with supply chains? Uh, supply chains with various different countries contributing to all these all these buildings being made. Yeah, because you need a lot of lithium and you need a lot of um, super semiconductors. Um, actually, that, that's an interesting, the super semiconductors is an interesting one. Because, I mean, as you'll know, the Dutch um, and the Taiwanese are the world leaders in that technology. And they both just agreed with the Americans. They're not handing that tech to the Chinese. Um, there's a new law gone, gone through Congress about it, and and they're ten, they are ten years ahead, so that that that's potential problem. Um, again, in the I think unlikely event of a war over Taiwan, I think there'll be an immediate um, economic crisis globally, and 
prime well it'd be about a lot of things including shipping trade but it will also be about the semiconductors because we saw what happened during covid i mean i'll give you a small example i've got a, a, a volvo car it's got those uh the, the wing mirrors have those lines that flash if someone's coming up on your inside well mine don't because that particular chip wasn't available during COVID and you can't apparently put it in afterwards. So I have the little lines, but they just don't do anything. That's the sort of thing um, that would happen in the space race. I mean, I suspect many of your listeners don't care because they have, have far more important things to worry about in the supply chains for, let's say, well, Volvo or the German car industry or everything else that we're doing. Nevertheless, it would have a massive knock-on effect because these things have thousands of semiconductor chips in them. I mean, just, I think a ballistic missile has something like 74 chips in it. That's just one ballistic missile. So that, that's a problem. Um, obviously, the competition for things like lithium uh, on Earth is, is heating up. So if you don't get your supply chain of that and all the other stuff you need, it'll be very hard for you to be a leader in the space race. But I mean, that, that's that's the simple economics, the way it is with the car industry. I, I don't know if you saw, but I thought the Germans pulled off a blinder recently. Um, Schultz went to Argentina and said, stop sending all your lithium to China to be um, processed. We'll build your factories for you, and then you'll give us a guarantee of lithium. It's one of those things that's just so blindingly obvious when it's done. So yeah, they need they need the supply for the same reasons as we all need the different supply chains here on Earth. Actually, that brings us on nicely to the last question. What te technological advancements are necessary to make space exploration more accessible and sustainable? Um, uh, accessible is already happening. Um, you know, we discussed the miniaturization. Of, of, of various things. Um, there's more efficient fuels, there's the reusable rockets, there's the idea of, of um, solar panels in space, all, all that is sustainable uh, and reducing the costs. Um, but no, I, I don't, I, I think we have to go through that period where it's not a very environmentally friendly industry before you can get to the part where it is an environmentally friendly industry. I mean, you can make the argument with an electric car, you know, they, a car maker has to make and have enough profits of petrol cars before it can have investing in electric cars, which I know are also polluting, but not as bad. Uh, and then they move towards making things more and more efficient. And you, you go through that transition of the space industry, I think will, will have to be the same. Hey, Tim, actually, just one final, final question. In your view, when do you see it that we might see regular space launches for people going onto the moon, spending a few uh, weeks out there, coming back with some raw materials, and that being just a regular thing rather than an absolute newsworthy thing? Not this decade. Um, in this decade, we will see more and more very, very wealthy people going all the way out into space and hopefully back. It's like Musk said, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. Um, 2030s, 10 years. I, I think even that's a bit optimistic. You know, I, I don't see how you can make it economically viable for mass space tourism uh, over the next 20 years. But I am, I am remembering Kitty Hawk, or the Wright Brothers Flyer One, as it's properly called 1903 it took off from memory um, and it was th about 35 years later that more Americans were traveling by plane than by train just from that one Kitty Hawk taking off 35 years later millions and millions of people so things can happen uh, so if we get technological breakthroughs, then yeah, sure, 2030s. Otherwise, I think we're looking at 2040s. And I presume if you sell a couple more books, you'll be on the Virgin, Virgin Galactic flight I'll very, very soon. One. If, if, you want to, if you want to lend me that money for 50 years, I'll... Uh, <laughs> actually, I haven't got that long. 
yeah. I'll pay you back in 30 years. <laughs> That's lovely. I'll take it. Tim Marshall, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Well, that was the show. We very much hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more, please head to schroders.com forward slash insights. And we're endeavouring to record as many of these shows in the studio on video. And if you want to watch them in their full unabridged version, uh, then go to Schroder's YouTube channel. If you want to get in touch with us, it's Schroder's podcast at schroders.com. And remember, you can listen, subscribe and review the Investor Download wherever you get your podcasts. New shows drop every Thursday at 5 p.m. UK time. But above all, keep safe and go well. Cheers. The value of investments and the income from them may go down as well as up. And investors may not get back the amounts originally invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The information is not an offer, solicitation or recommendation of any funds, services or products or to adopt any investment strategy. 